So in the last class, uh, sure. yes, yes. Tell me. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes. So well, in the last class, uh -huh. the driving license example in normative what sense of the term? I did not get that. The driving license example, the license part you mean? Yes, sir. So the thing is this that you know we understand ought in what terms that we, we say that well you ought to do or you ought not to do okay that's how we understand ought okay it either it commands you to do something or not do something isn't it Sumit, yes, sir. me okay yes sir but then there are laws okay that permit you to do something okay or authorizes you to do something so when you are permitted to do something, it does not say that, well, you ought to do something. Okay. So for example, if you are permitted to drive a car on the road, it does not mean that you ought to drive. Does it mean you, if you have the permission to drive a car because you have the license, does it mean that you ought to drive? No, Is that sir. how we interpret? No, sir. Then how do we account for permissions then? Okay. In Kelsen's theory. So he says that. Well, there still is an ought, okay, that we can, you know, trace, but the ought is not directed to the person who has the permission, okay. The ought is directed to others. So, for example, the police, traffic police officer would otherwise be, you know, justified in, in you know, stopping you, okay, and preventing you from driving will now not have that you know, power, that authority. So, it is directed to the, that police officer that you ought not to, you know, you ought to let this person drive, okay? You not, you ought not to interfere with his driving unless there is a valid cause, okay? Then there's a norm that exists, okay? So, for example, if you're over speeding, then there's a norm that says that you shall not, you ought not to over speed. So, if the over speed limit is 80 km per hour, you're driving at 90 km per hour. So, yeah, there is a norm that says that you ought not to drive you know, more than 80 km per hour. So you have already violated the norm here. Then the police officer will definitely have justification to stop you from, you know, doing that. So, but in other cases, when you are permitted to drive, that does not mean that you ought to drive. It means that police, you know, traffic police, okay, who would otherwise be authorized to interfere, okay, stop you, now ought not to do that, you know. He ought to, or she ought to allow you to drive. And others ought to tolerate your, uh, uh, others ought to tolerate your, you know, driving. I mean, not crazy driving, but your driving on the road, okay? That's the ought that we can, that he's talking about here, okay? The same goes for even authorization. So he gives an example, an act of parliament authorizes, but does not compel the minister to make regulations, okay? So it's up to the ministers to introduce a legislation, okay? He's talking about a parliamentary form of you know, democracy, clearly. So, yeah, a minister might introduce a legislation, but a minister is not compelled to introduce a legislation. A municipality, you know, board might have the authority to come up with, you know, bylaws, okay? But it is not compelled to make bylaws, okay? So how do we account for all that? Well, it's, it's the same way as I just try to explain okay so so when someone is authorized once that person chooses to do something then others are expected to endure that so others ought to endure someone exercising their authority or some someone exercising you know a certain rights uh, as your liberties as he or she might have been given under a particular license okay so that's the case of permits so do i make sense here Yes, sir. yes, huh? I got it. Huh? Thank you, sir. So the ought is not directed to the person who who's uh, who's authorized, okay, okay, because uh, it just does not make sense. Nor is it directed towards the person who has the permit, okay. It just does not make sense. But there is ought, but it's directed to others, okay. So yeah, it can account for commands as well as authorizations and permissions, okay. So yeah. So then we'll proceed to his, you know, talking about this uh, three different, you know, things here. So the first two is like clear, okay, three different elements that he's uh, distinguishing, okay, in a legal process, okay. The first two is very clear, okay, there's a factual world, okay, and there's a normative world, okay. So a law exists, okay, law exists in the form of a legislation, in the form of a 
judicial precedent or in the form of a custom okay that is in the factual world because these are facts they exist these are facts okay but then there is a norm associated with that as well okay so yes the law says something okay you ought to do that okay so that's the legal norm that you derive from a particular fact okay now derive is not causation okay it's by virtue of interpretation okay so it's a mental process that he is talking about by which you come to that uh, legal norm so the fact has to be there and then in a parallel in a mental world there is the norm so but that's not the end of it he is saying that well uh, there is something else okay that is known as the statement of rule of law now how is the statement of rule of law different from a legal norm it is this that uh, a legal norm is neither true nor false okay whereas a statement of law or a statement of rule of law could be uh, you know true or false okay so for example the law of a particular country is this okay so one might be mistaken in that okay one might be mistaken stating that okay so that could be true or false okay so an example has been given there you see according to the law of england <clears throat> murder is punishable by life imprisonment okay now it could be true it could be false you have to look at the law and then confirm it well that's the case okay so that's a statement of rule of law whereas as opposed to that if you are talking in the normative sense okay that well he is talking about uh, that so let's take an ex indian example okay so indian penal code under you know um, 300 section 300 talks about murder okay it defines murder in a certain way okay so except in the cases you know accepted culpable homicide is murder if the act by which the death is caused is done on, with the intention of causing death or and so there are many other provisions that you can see in the definition and further it uh, under uh, 302 it talks about punishment for murder so it says whoever commits murder shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life or shall be liable to fine okay so you see that if you were to describe it okay if you were to describe it well law of india with respect to murder says so it could either be true or false okay someone might have misstated it okay if it is misstated then the you know statement of the rule of law is false okay but if it is stated properly it is correct okay but when you talk about it in the norm normative sense sense of the term that you ought not to commit murder okay mm, okay uh, as the norm as you can derive from this uh, you know particular uh, statement of rule of law okay then you do not say that that is true or false okay you ought not to do something there is no point talking about it in terms of true or false either it is either valid or it is not valid but it is not true or not false okay that's the third distinction that you know he draws here okay so i hope that is clear so these are some just you know some conceptual ideas that he is talking about this is not something that you will need to practice in the court of law but then an aspect of it is definitely necessary for you so as a lawyer as a lawyer when you argue on behalf of your client okay you will argue in that sense that yeah the other party ought not to have done something or, or ought to have done something when you say so you are using the you know you are not merely stating a uh, a law okay you're not merely stating a particular rule of law okay you're also talking about it in a normative sense of the term that you ought not to have done something but you have done something and hence you have to be punished okay so that's the element okay that's the normative element which is being pointed to us okay so i hope that makes sense okay am i clear here in explaining what kelsen is talking about here any difficulties in understanding this Did I make sense? Are you guys there? Yes, sir. Huh? Just, just so yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, then I'll proceed to the... So, Raz's part, you guys go ahead. I mean, that's not that important here. Okay, you guys go ahead. Okay, so now, a very important thing that we are going to address, okay? Something that is relevant in the context of a question which was uh, asked sir. yesterday by Pranav Gandhi. Yes, yes. Who is it? Harsh, no, yes. Which, which part? Which part? That was not clear. Uh, uh, Pranav Gandhi had yesterday asked me that uh, 
the grand norm, okay, the basic norm, grand norm, okay, from which we trace the validity of all other norms, okay. Does it have to do something with morality? Okay, does it have to have moral content? Okay, this is a question which was asked by Pranav Gandhi, if I remember correctly, yesterday. Yes, huh? <clears throat> so that's the portion, okay. I didn't quite clearly explain it because the topic of discussion will be dealt with today. But I told you that, well, <clears throat> the first premise that any legal positivist have is this, that there is no necessary connection between law and morality, okay? So they say that law and morality quite often do overlap. Fine, no denying that. Judges do, you know, quite often decide, you know, matters based on some moral, you know, principles. No denying that. But conceptually, there is no necessary connection between morality and law. A law could be law even when it is not moral. But quite often, the laws are moral. Okay. Now, the same position is also held by our philosopher here. Okay. But he, <clears throat> but he draws a distinction. So, so he. That's why I told you guys yesterday that well, the basic norm could incorporate. Okay could incorporate certain moral principles, okay, certain moral precepts, okay, but that's not what makes it basic norm, okay, it's basic norm because it is basic norm, you have to presuppose it, okay, there is no other question to be asked, because if you ask any other question, then the entire setup falls apart, I'll try to give you guys a certain examples and then make it as understandable as possible, so yes, uh, today we are, you know, we are going to look at, um, I'm sorry you might hear some whistling, you know, nearby, that's the bird, you know, you know, here. So, yeah, so today we are going to make this distinction between, you know, two different kinds of norms. You have moral norms and then you have legal norms, okay. Now, legal norms could have moral content, okay, quite often it does have moral content, okay. It not, it need not necessarily have moral content, that's what is the position that is held, okay. Uh, so, yes, uh, <clears throat> these two are norms, both both these are norms, okay. Uh, so, he is saying that a legal norm quite often could possibly give, give effect to certain moral norm, okay. Now, that legal norm is not valid because it has given effect to certain moral norm, okay. It is valid because it is valid in accordance with another higher you know, valid legal norm. That's how we draw the validity of a legal norm, okay? The, yeah, obviously the same applies even in case of moral norms, okay? So what is the validity of a moral norm? Obviously there's a higher moral norm, okay, that validates a particular norm, moral norm, okay? But then legality and morality are not to be confused, okay? Quite often they overlap, okay? So it's said that like all other positivists, even Kelsen denied that there was necessary connection between law and morality. A law that gives effect to moral rule is not because of its moral content, but because it has been constituted in accordance with, in particular fashion, born of a definite procedure and a definite rule of law. Okay. So he's stating facts here, but you know that alongside those facts, there are norms that if the laws are created following those appropriate procedures then those laws are to be laws ought to be followed so that higher norm gives validity to the you know inferior you know norm so that's what he's talking about the inferior norm is valid not because it has moral content but because but because it is imputed by another higher norm so that's his position okay now how do we distinguish between legal norms and moral norms, okay? They are quite similar to a great extent, okay? Both have oughts, okay? Both have oughts. We talk about norm in terms of what? You ought not to murder, okay? And then if you look at, uh, you know, section 300 IPC and 302, if you read this too, then you come to the conclusion that you ought not to commit murder, okay? And then moral, moral, moral principles also say that, well, you ought not to commit murder, okay? So how do we distinguish them as a person who knows nothing about with, whether one is legal or moral? How does one differentiate between these two? So that's what he's going to help us with. So he's saying that moral norms, just like legal norms, have both subjective as well as objective you know, existence. Okay, so there could be many different moral positions. Okay. And, but not everything will be objectively valid here, okay, objectively, uh, uh, you know, normative here. 
so he's giving you but i do not subscribe to certain ideas that he's talking about here okay the idea of moral norms that he's talking about seems to be a sub case of subjective morality okay and within that subjectiveness he's talking about objective validity of a particular more objective validity of a particular moral norm okay now there's a huge discussion that exists whether morality of exists objectively okay whether objective morality is true or it does not exist whether morality is subjective altogether okay that debate is already there so kelsen does not address that question and he's simply saying that well there is subjective moral morality here okay morality is you know almost always subjective that's the impression that i get from what he is saying here so he is saying that moral norms like legal norms have both subjective and objective existence so he is giving you the example here okay a vegetarian i mean the author of this book okay a vegetarian may say that all persons ought to abstain from eating animal products but if you are so that's a subjective moral position but if you live in a place where most of the people do not subscribe to it okay then you would say that well it is not objectively valid okay you would say that well it's not objectively true okay well if that's the case okay if that's the case then does morality make any sense okay i think moral for me the idea is that morality does not depend on a large portion of the people accepting particular you know uh, idea of morality it does not depend on that morality could be objectively true no matter what others think okay so that's something i don't see him addressing here so he further says that this is subjectively true for vegetarian okay maybe for vegans okay not even vegetarian but it has no objective existence in a society of committed meat eaters so you are merely talking about existence of that moral principle in a particular community but morality is not about existence of a particular belief in a particular community it's something that is true despite what a large majority of people might believe in so if large majority of the people in a particular you commu know community believe that it is okay to still that does not make it you know any less uh, uh, objectively true okay that uh, it, that does not make the norm that you ought not to still any less objectively true so that is th something that i you know think has not been addressed by the author here okay but then you can definitely say that it is definitely applicable in the case of legal orders okay so yes there could so uh, to understand legal norm okay in the subjective objective sense i think you do not need to uh, get confused about it much because we already discussed this uh, yesterday that uh, robber you know asks for money from you pointing a gun at your head and then the tax collector asks for demands that you pay money otherwise some sanction will be imposed the distinction the difference here is quite clear in the sense that well the tax collector's demand is validated by another norm so there's no problem with that but the explanation with respect to you know moral objectivity and subjectivity at least the way it has been explained here is not appropriate according to my view but the book says well that's what it is well yeah so moral norms could be objective as well okay it does it does not have to depend on okay how you know people in a particular group subjectively you know think this or that to be true about moral principles it does not have to depend on that okay so that's a that's a problem that i came across so did i make sense in what i just said yes yes sir huh? yes sir huh? you may disagree as well no problem with that okay but that's what has been said that even when it comes to uh, um, but, yes. sir, uh -huh. and how will we define what is morality if it is not what the majority thinks obviously i mean say uh, it cannot be about morality there are certain things that we know object uh, are uh, you know objectively right and wrong okay i have to say object when i talk about objectively you know right and wrong i do not mean that we cannot know why it is right and wrong okay so i say that you know murder is wrong because a society in which murder is okay is a society that is not viable so i as a consequentialist you know uh, thinker i say that morality is wrong in that society okay so the objectivity that i'm talking here here about uh, uh, here is not something that you have to trace from the ether 
given this is the reality okay G given this is the reality and this is the information that i have okay this is how I'm, I'm able to process this information and this is the objective answer that i come to that it is not okay it is wrong to kill someone got the idea so yeah that is how i think we come to objective conclusion about whether it is right or wrong to you know murder but then when i say objectively it is you know it is objectively right uh, you know um, that i should not murder okay but does that mean that in no situation you know killing someone is objectively correct okay or not justifiable i'm not denying that the situation changes then the objective true truth of that situation will also change so for example some someone tries to kill you and the only way you you can save yourself is by killing that person okay Hi, unless you are responsible in instigating that person to kill you yes in those situation the facts circumstances change and the objective reality objective truth of that situation will also change so yes there is a bit of subjectivity within the objectivity of you know morality but then that is nonetheless an object a kind of objective truth okay when i say objective i do not superstitiously adhere to that idea okay in a particular given situation given the information that i have there has to be a objectively you know true true answer but then how do i know it is well that's the limitation that our human minds have okay but we have a responsibility at all points of time to come at the best possible judgment regarding what is objectively the right thing to do so that's my position okay you need not subscribe to it there might be other objective moral principles so for example if you were one of the philosophers like um, uh, who is the last philosopher that we studied from natural law school it's John Finnis, okay? John Finnis gives you a different idea of objective, uh, you, know, uh, you know, truth, doesn't he? Uh, when it comes to morality, he talks about basic goods and from there you trace, you know, what is the right thing to do. So, yes, uh, that's, that's the kind of objective, you know, truth, you know, that you can talk about when, you, when it comes to moral philosophy. Now, for example, forget about my position. Now, Finnis' idea, okay, when he talks about objective goods and from there you come to conclusions about what is the right thing to do, what is, you know, morality, those conclusions do not depend upon different people, you know, converging and thinking that, well, this is what the right thing to do. No, that's not the case. If that were the case, then everything will be justifiable, okay? Majority who comes to power with vote, enough vote, will be justified in disenfranchising minority so as to retain the power forever okay so i'm not talking about all that okay so i hope uh, this is clear that yes uh, morality cannot be only about people converging and then thinking that well this is the right idea of morality morality could exist despite people thinking this or that which is not addressed in the first you know idea that we just discussed so am i making sense yes sir okay okay then i'll proceed to the next next one okay so <clears throat> So he says that we cannot distinguish, okay, so how do we distinguish, you know, moral norm from a legal norm? So there are many ways in which we cannot distinguish it, okay, one way that we cannot distinguish it is in terms of its content, okay, we cannot do that. So for example, your Indian penal code says that you shall not, you ought not to commit murder, okay. So do many moral, you know, principles say that, okay, come from, even from different backgrounds would say that, well, you ought not to kill someone, okay, you ought not to murder, be it biblical idea of morality or any other idea of morality, you might say that you ought not to commit murder, okay, or morality of a particular group as is being talked about here, it, it, there's a high likelihood that it will say that you ought not to commit murder, so you see that the content wise they overlap, okay, so we cannot distinguish legal norm from a moral norm in terms of their content, okay, however he says that there is a certain kind of you know moral norm okay uh, that cannot be a legal norm because it is purely directed to your own self so so if you if, if you for example you know make uh, any resolution okay that you know um, i will not i will stop drinking from now on i will smoke uh, stop smoking from now on so the ought here is that i ought not to <laughs> drink okay that I'll control my drinking, okay? So that's a moral norm that is directed inwards towards your own self, okay? Now such norms, okay, if at all they're moral norms, can never be 
legal norms okay because it was inward directed it just does not make sense that well what i think i ought to do is a legal norm it's clearly not the case but what he is saying is that based apart from this in other cases okay apart from the inwardly directed you know moral norms if you may when it comes to others we cannot differentiate based on content okay so as you know abortion might be allowed okay by a particular legal system it might not be allowed by a particular legal system now for from certain moral perspective okay abortion okay if you are christian uh, uh, if you are from christian moral perspective okay the judeo christian morality uh, does not allow, allow abortion okay so one might say that well it's not allowed so if a particular country's legal you know norm does not allow it you see it's overlapping okay but it, um, so yeah that's what he's saying that you cannot distinguish you know these two based on their content okay nor can you dis distinguish, distinguish them based on how and where they are created okay the way they are created what does that mean so um, if you see okay so our previous okay the um, fact positivist that we have studied okay bentham and austin their idea was that well laws are command of sovereign okay so law exists only in a political community where there is sovereign if there is no sovereign there is no uh, political order and then there is no law that's the kind of position that uh, thinkers like austin had okay but that theory also had this uh, tendency of being condescending towards other legal orders other legal systems that exist elsewhere okay so he would say that legal systems do not exist in all those other legal systems where you know in all those other places where there is no sovereign or there is no political order so but you know that there are many other places a close knit societies where they are you know guided by customary laws now uh, a philosopher uh, 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 john austin would say that that's not even law properly so called okay so but then you see that here in his philosophy in our in the philosophy of uh, hans kelsen he is able to incorporate that okay uh, now yeah now that that somehow creates a problem for us here okay when it comes to distinguishing between legal norm on the one hand and moral norm on the other so why is that the case okay one might say that well uh, when it comes to creation of legal norms it can only arise from you know you know uh, sovereign okay only sovereign's command is uh, you know legal norm okay well then we restrict uh, you know the idea of legal norms to only certain you know communities okay but there are other communities where laws emerge not just by you know virtue of you know uh, you know personal command of you know command of law making authority but also by virtue of custom okay so how do we account for that okay so we'll we'll deal with that question later on but for now what he is saying is that that legal norm and moral norm both can come in, come into existence through either of these two ways okay it could come into existence either through exercise of authority but by virtue of a certain command or it could also come into existence by virtue of customary uh, you know in practices okay so yeah how the hell does it uh, we know that legal legal norms can arise and do arise through commands okay through commands okay but how does moral norm emerge from com command okay now it does uh, uh, arise okay uh, so yeah some priest in a church okay or some you know ecclesiastical position somewhere okay they might say that well i have i am getting this revelation from some higher source okay and this is what you ought to do so he is saying that uh, yes yeah uh, moral rules okay moral norms can emerge through that mechanism as well okay and at the same time it can also it definitely emerges in many different places based on customary practices as it exists okay now what about legal norms we definitely know as austin would say that legal norms do emerge through uh, customs but legal norms do not just emerge from customary you know uh, sorry uh, sorry from only commands by you know sovereign they also emerge through customary practices okay so that's why i said that he considers 
uh, what Austin would exclude as a legal system also as a kind of legal system okay so for Hart in primitive societies uh, there were only laws but not legal system for Kelsen he would say that even in primitive societies they had legal systems okay mm, so he is saying that law can emerge uh, through customs through through you know personal authority through commands as well as through customs so so is the case with moral norms even moral norms emerge through authority okay some kind of commands and as well as through customs so based on how they are created okay we cannot distinguish between legal norm and moral norm on the other hand so did i make sense here Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so and then let's see uh, how else we are going to fail in doing that. Okay, so yeah, we've seen that the content does not help, the way the mode of creation does not help. Okay, so maybe the way the laws are applied, okay, the norms are applied, sorry, the legal and moral norms are applied, maybe that will help us. Okay, now, um, oh, no, sorry. Our philosopher here, he thinks that even the way by which, you know, uh, you know, norms are applied, even that is not of much help, okay? So we might have this assumption in our head that, okay, you, you need some specialized mechanisms, okay, specialized institutions, bodies to enforce the law, and only then you have legal norm, okay? So that would be, for example, you have a police force out there, you have courts, okay? You have prison, prison warden, you have all those different, you know, you know, mechanisms, modern mechanisms put in place, okay? Only then legal norm is possible, okay? But just like, you know, as we were discussing earlier, he is not saying that law exists only in today's sophisticated legal systems, okay? Sophisticated um, uh, in today's times only, okay? So in today's time, you might have this, you know, specialized mechanisms. But laws and legal system existed even in primitive societies, okay? And they did not have these specialized mechanisms to enforce the law. So would we say that they didn't have law? Well, no, even they had law and they also had a legal system. Well, well, that's the case. Then what's the case with morality? Okay, moral norms. Well, uh, the same goes for them, okay? So obviously moral systems you know when when it comes to moral moral norms you do not have specialized agencies okay specialized enforcement agencies you know applying moral norms but then there are other ways of you know enforcing uh, uh, moral laws okay so if that is also allowed okay if that's that's the, you know uh, uh, through a less sophisticated mechanism moral norms can be applied then that cannot be the way you know, the methods of their application cannot be used to say that, well, this is how moral norms and legal norms are different, okay? You may say that, well, when it comes to legal norm, state, uh, you know, what do you call it? The specialized enforcement agencies are definitely there. Well, in case of moral norms, they are not there, but then they are also, uh, you know, enforced if not through this, you know, uh, specialized enforcement agencies, then by virtue of certain other ways. So, for example, social disapproval, okay, boycott, whatever it is, okay. But then they can be enforced by virtue of that, okay. So, yes, even that does not, even how it is enforced does not really help us in distinguishing between legal norms on the one hand and moral norms on the other. So then what is it that helps us in distinguishing legal and moral you know, norms, okay? He says that the legal order is a coercive order, okay? So that's the distinguishing factor here that when it comes to enforcing legal norm, coercion is there. When it comes to coercion, I mean kind of sanction which is kind of physical in nature is there, okay? When I say physical, it does not have to be someone physically restrained or beaten up, no, nothing like that. But you have a different kind of, you know, coercion uh, as opposed to uh, moral norms. So you do not have coercive mechanism. All that you can uh, do to enforce any moral norms is uh, show your disapproval, okay? People might say that, well, we disapprove of what you are doing, what you are saying. You cannot compel that person, physically restrain that person or uh, physically force that person to do something or not do something. 
Well, that is a feature of a legal norm. So that's why he says that the difference lies in the fact that legal order is a coercive order, whereas a moral order is not. Okay. So the quotation uh, quoted mark here says, okay, the fundamental difference between law and morals is that law is a coercive order, that is a normative order, order that attempts to bring about a certain behavior by attaching to the opposite behavior, a socially organized coercive act, okay? Whereas morals uh, is a social order without such sanctions, okay? That kind of sanctions. Sanctions of the moral order are merely approval of the non-conforming and the disapproval of the norm-opposing behavior. No coercive acts are prescribed as sanctions. So you will not be forced into following any moral belief okay so for example a particular religious belief does not allow uh, you know abortion but the legal system you know the legal norm allows that so even if so you belong to a particular community that believes that well abortion is not cool okay so you abort okay which is allowed by the legal system okay then these people cannot compel you from aborting okay so they can only show their disapproval of what you are doing so that's what is being talked about okay uh, that's how uh, you know they distinguish it but then again okay if it is merely based on the sanction the coercion that and that is being talked about how the hell is he different from austin then okay uh, so the difference is that uh, the kind of coercion that we are talking about okay so according to him okay what is needed for a society to, have, society to have laws is the means of applying socially organized coercion. Okay, that is uh, that is that is essentially what is you know important here. Okay, so you need not, unlike John Austin, you do not need the uh, need sovereign. Okay, even without sovereign uh, or the idea of sovereign, if you have this socially organized you know you know mechanism to force coercion then obviously that's enough for legal order to exist but then uh, the legal order cannot be all about coercion okay it has to be something more than merely the sanction here so what is that okay so as you know in the john austin's philosophy okay uh, we had difficulties in defining what is a legal obligation okay why is that because it's purely empirical and factual in nature okay so when do i have obligation to the extent that I have the likelihood of getting caught and being punished. If there is very little likelihood of me getting, no likelihood of me getting, you know, caught or punished, okay, then I do not have any obligation, or at least that's the interpretation we can have of the idea of obligation in the works of John Austin. But that's ridiculous, isn't it? There are many thieves who steal and escape the grip of the law. There are many people who cheat you know, your money and then escape from this country. Does this mean that there is no law, okay? Pro proscribing, prohibiting one from doing that. We wouldn't say that. So that's the uh, another part, okay? Another clarification which has been added. It is this, that, well, coercion is there, but uh, it is to be applied, but it is not necessarily the case that in every single situation, Coercion, coercion will in fact be applied okay so factual application of coercion in every single case is not necessary as long as the mechanism to apply coercion exists you can say that well that's a legal order okay now in one or two cases or in some cases if someone escapes uh, you know with an infraction of law does not mean that the law does not exist so if there is a prohibition on you going across the street when uh, you know there is a red light but you see jaywalkers you know going across the street nonetheless does not make it make make the law that you know prohibits you from doing that you know non-existent okay that's not what it is okay all that is required is that there is a coercive mechanism if that is okay socially organized coercive mechanism if that is there okay you do not need sovereign nor nor is there a need of successful you know uh, uh, use of coercion in every other case okay if that is the case then you have a legal order <clears throat> so yeah so that's how he makes this distinction first distinction between legal order and a moral order but that's not the end of the discussion though, okay. 
Uh, the other aspect of and the distinction, okay, other important distinction that he makes is this, that legal order is a dynamic order, okay. So legal order is necessarily a dynamic order, you can say, okay. Whereas moral order could either be dynamic or could also be static, okay. Now what does that mean, okay. So in legal order, uh, the highest norm, so for example, the basic norm, does not specifically determine the content of the other inferior norms okay the contents substantive contents of those specific you know lower not lower order norms could vary okay a law might allow you to undergo abortion it might not under, uh, allow you to undergo abortion a law might allow you to uh, what do you call it uh, you know enter into marriage with someone of your own sex it might not you know allow you to do that whatever it is okay it could be so whatever is the substantive content of the law so look at uh, you know uh, the case of 377 okay the law changed okay the content of that specific law changed okay that did not change the uh, that did not have any effect on the highest you know norm that is the grand norm the grand norm remains same okay nor did the grand norm change so as to change the content of the nor did the grand norm determine what the content of the lower order norms would be okay but we cannot say the same thing about moral norms okay moral norms quite often could be dynamic okay so example that is given is that of so for example dynamic okay but it could also be static okay it could also be static okay static in what sense that a legal norm okay sorry a moral norm okay so for example uh, if it prohibits you from doing something in all possible cases okay so for example if you are a Jain okay and the moral principle among Jains is that it that of non-violence okay you shall not eat meat okay or kill okay so you know that their grand norm you know if it is based on you know non-violence can in no way okay the substantive content of any other norm cannot in any way be in favor of animal cruelty or killing uh, of animal for human consumption okay so you see that in such moral order it is definitely static it does not in any way allow variation or deviation from the idea that you shall not uh, you know commit cruelty to animals or eat animals okay that is in no way allowable okay so you see that the grand norm there determines the specific content and that remains static when it comes to moral order in case of legal order that's not the case Okay, that's not the case that's what that's how he is distinguishing between legal order on the one hand and the moral order on the other okay but as he says okay this should not lead us to conclude that in in legal order in legal order there is no restraint whatsoever on the content of uh, on the content of the lower order you know norms okay that's not the case either either some kind of restriction can definitely be imposed. So, for example, if constitution is the highest grand norm, okay, and it lays down, and it lays down certain, <clears throat> uh, uh, what do you call it, certain basic rights, okay, certain fundamental rights, okay, they are not to be deviated from, okay, they are not to be deviated from, okay. So, yes, certain restrictions are definitely imposed, okay, but apart from that, there is quite a bit of dynamicity uh, mm, when it comes to, uh, um, legal order but he's saying that the same cannot be said of moral orders which can be both dynamic as well as uh, static uh, so this is how he distinguishes between uh, uh, legal order on the one hand and moral order on the other so did I make sense I mean the way I was trying to explain mm, was it making sense yes sir okay anyone with any difficulty yes sir yes sir Okay then. Sir, uh, uh, can you please explain the Jain example which